My name is Susan Allen, and I'm here from Susan Allen Financial, and I have two guests with us here today. We have Donna Brooks from Original Body Wisdom and Linda Tumbarello, and she is a body-based psychotherapist. What I wanted to ask both of you, or we can start with Donna, um, what it, to tell me a little bit about if someone comes to see you, where do you start? What approach do you start with to help them? Well, um, I've been a yoga teacher since 1981, but I've also integrated a lot of what we can call somatic movement. And somatic movement is really about introducing um, possibilities to the body so it can recover its natural movement. So as children, remember how you really just felt great in your body mm -hmm. and you could do everything and it wasn't unless you really did something crazy or scary that you hurt yourself. That kind of intelligence is available to us now as adults. We just have mm -hmm. to recover it. And so what I do is I introduce interesting movement, ways of moving to people that are gentle and fun and playful and relaxing and they start let, letting go of habits that mm -hmm. impede this original body wisdom. Okay, and Linda, how about you? Where do you start when a client comes to you? Well, clients who come, come for both physical and emotional reasons, injuries mm -hmm. or other kinds of issues that they have. So um, I like to think of myself kind of like a detective. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I first kind of look at when somebody walks in my office, like what can, what can I offer them uh, right away that can help them feel better in some way? And what can I teach them so they can go home and do something for themselves? And then after that, look at um, what is really the cause of the problem? Is it a physical, emotional problem? Um, what's causing it? How is it how they use their bodies? And then the next part would be kind of uh, how, if there are limitations, mm -hmm. how can we, you know, work with, with them. Now, Donna, do you provide some sort of a, an assessment when somebody first comes to see you? Yeah, like today I um, worked with a gentleman I've been working with for, I don't know, probably about, mm, probably about three, four months. And he came to me because he loves walking. He's in his 70s, he wants to keep walking, but he has hip pain and knee pain. So what I do initially is an assessment of what his gait is like, um, what are the mechanics of his moving, what is hurting when in terms of his stride and his step, and then I introduce changes and possibilities. And again, they're very, very pleasant and they're very subtle. It's um, really interesting, um, you know, when you, you get a response from a client who says like, wow, I can't believe like that little difference. Like at what moment mm. am I pushing off the ball of my foot that suddenly pain in his knee will go away? Wow. So one of the things that's prevented me from investigating yoga further is that I've taken a few classes with my mother-in-law. Oh, nice. <laughs> and she's just so great at it. But my thing is that they tend to be so um, in the head with it. And I'm just not that type of a person. I'm so glad you're saying that because one of my big kind of departing points from a lot of yoga is that I'm really not interested in imposing postures on the body. So I'm not, you know, gonna stand in front of a room and say, oh, do this and do this this way. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, I was walking with, working with another student of mine on, um, uh, Vrikshasana, the tree pose. And so most people do that by like really struggling to stand on one foot and turning their knee out to the side as far as they can or maybe in alignment of their hip with their hip if they're in a better class. And But I was just curious like, well, where's the pivot point of your foot? And where does that pivot point lead your knee? And when you find where it leads the knee, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this feels good to stretch. And it may not look like what mm -hmm. a tree pose or a vrikshasana might look like if someone was demonstrating it, but it's the right thing for the person's body. And that's, so it unfolds again from that sense of what is my body's wisdom. Okay, if, great. So it can be much more fun. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's great. And Linda, tell us like the importance of working both the body and the mind together. Like sometimes people go to di in different avenues and they just focus on one, but Tell us a little bit more about bringing both of those together. Uh, well, I can use an example. It's interesting. It's somewhat similar because it's a client who came uh, who was having hip pain. Mm -hmm. And um, she had often people who come to me have, all, have tried many different practitioners um, before they get to me. And she, 
everybody that she saw just focused on her hip. Okay. <laughs> and um, I also look at, you know, how, what the whole body is connected. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes what, where the pain is or the issue isn't about that area of the body, but it's another part of the body that's causing that issue. Sometimes uh, a hip pain could be from the ankle, from the knee, from the back. And as, as she, uh, as she be, had more problems, it also became um, more difficult emotionally. She had to stop walking, and that was a big social time for her. She had to stop exercising. And another real important body-mind issue is how people respond when they have a condition or an injury. Mm -hmm. And people think, I really think it's uh, the body has a kind of a, a trauma response. People talk about that more in kind of big, big issues or emotionally. But when you have an injury or condition, you tend to tighten around it. And it's, it's natural. It's actually useful when you first have an injury to limit movement in the area until your body kind of figures out what to do. But if it becomes a pattern, like you start to have pain and then you, you hold there, it really gets in the way of healing and it, it makes the pain worse. So look, looking at that patterns is, is very important and teaching like with this client, teaching her to breathe and to say things, you know, say, say it's gonna be okay, you know, say different things to herself than like each time she had a pain, like, oh, it's all over, I won't be able to walk anymore. Or, um, so that's one, one example. And what about breathing? Now, does that, is that an important part of this whole process? is so important. And um, it's interesting because when Linda was just talking about like that reaction, it's like in a way everything is cued into our nervous system. You know, it's like that's where we build up all our habits. I like this idea I heard years ago about if our nervous system didn't pick up habits, you'd have to learn how to start your car every time you went mm -hmm. into it. Okay. So your nervous system develops this habit if you want it or not. So definitely, if you've been injured for a while or if you, you know, if something emotionally, I'm sure, traumatically happens to you and you tighten for that too and you grip, your nervous system encodes that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to let go of that, but breath is a really useful key to letting go of that because breath kind of helps modulate our um, nervous system response. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that I really like to offer people that's, I think, different than a lot of breathing because people will often say, you know, you should breathe deeply. The first kind of myth I'd like to, to address is that there's no perfect breath. You know, breath is variable and we need different ways of breathing for different activities. And that said, in our culture, a lot of people are really anxious, intense, and we do kind of <laughs> breathe like this, right? <laughs> not <laughs> the, me. Not you. <laughs> but oh, the yeah. way to breathe, and from my experience, to get a deeper breath isn't by trying to get a deeper breath, but it's by following your exhalation. Mm -hmm. So even if you just try that now, like just try to really feel a complete exhalation, like try to notice how much it dissipates and dissipates and dissipates, and see then if your next inhalation comes in easier. So you don't have to prompt a deep breath. You just can let it go, and then you breathe. It's easy. So I'm getting the idea that a lot of this is individualized as opposed to like, per in comparison to like personal training or rehab. You're really looking at each person as an individual yeah. and kind of seeing what their habits are and where, you know, what their personal problems are. Oh, okay. absolutely. All right. Yeah. Well, I'd like to talk about yeah, breathing. breathing. It's one yeah. of my I was going to <laughs> ask you, yeah. <laughs> favorite favorite um, things. And wh one of the things I, I like about breathing is that um, I don't know if people wonder how many times a day you breathe. I mean, some people I ask that question yeah, and they'll say a hundred or a billion, but we breathe about 18,000 times a day. And to me, that allows us, I think of it as 18,000 opportunities to, because with one breath you can calm yourself, you can start energizing yourself, you can kind of return to yourself. Mm -hmm. And if we use the, the breath, um, one of the things, my training uh, is, is also called body-mind centering, it's one of the things I do, and it's really looking at the whole body 
uh, from the inside, how we experience ourselves, our anatomy, our body, how it works. So the, br the breath also is a wonderful um, experience of taking in and letting go. So any of those 18,000 times we can let go of not only of our breath, but uh, beliefs that don't help us, tension, fears, it's a way out, and we can breathe in calmness, we can, we can bring in what we need. And that's very important, the sense of, of receiving that nourishment from breath. Mm -hmm. Now are there any um, quick or immediate things that people could do, just start with the breathing to you know, feel calmer, feel better, kind of relate to their whole? Well, I would say again, following your exhalation. Like real, I mean that's so simple and it's not done that much and so just you can use a little bit of a visualization with it in the sense that you know how um, you're at the ocean and you're watching the waves right mm -hmm. so there's the the wave that comes to shore and it starts kind of strong mm -hmm. and it gets softer and softer and softer so if you wanted to just like in this moment you could notice your wave that exhalation getting softer and softer and softer and just see what that does to your breathing. So I know I'm taking a little bit of a risk here, but you know, like just see if you can yeah. find even a pause because that exhalation really dissipates to nothing. Mm -hmm. And in that nothingness, a new breath will come. And I mean, I'm not a psychotherapist and I don't you know, typically work with people's minds, but you know, in my work, as I know Linda's, you can't really differentiate body and mind. Mm -hmm. So notice if by taking that exhalation there is more calm and there's more ease just by following it, not even having to do anything with it, just noticing the naturalness of it. So Donna, what would bring somebody to come to see somebody like you as opposed to going to a personal trainer? Um, a lot of people come to me who have been to personal trainers and have been to yoga and Pilates and all sorts of stuff. And those things are valuable. I mean, there is, and there are some really great trainers and yoga teachers mm -hmm. and Pilates, but I'm going more subtle. I'm going to another level of the lived body. And it is more, you know, people have told me I should call my work different things like homeopathic yoga, um, <laughs> movement meditations because it, it really is, you know, I like this word somatic and I know it's um, a funny word, but it's, it's the experience of the lived body. So instead of sort of seeing our body as an object to improve or control or, or manipulate, I'm actually inviting people to have a lived experience of their movement and themselves and their bodies. And Linda, how about you? Why would we come to see you as opposed um, to a personal trainer? Uh, well, I think what I said before about looking at the whole body, that was a whole thing that, that and, and to bring in the, the different aspects of, of like, for example, with breath. So one way I, I would work, I use touch too. That's, I'm trained in touch movement and psychotherapy. So I would actually help somebody to, if I was working with breath, to, to feel their body, I would bring my hands. Um, I would um, teach them, like one of wonderful thing that we can do that is, because you were asking before about what things people can do, um, is just to sometimes bring your hand right here on your chest here. This is a, bur a bone here, it's called the sternum. Mm -hmm. And the word means shield. It's mm -hmm. a shield for the heart. So for example, if someone comes to me and they, they, they have a lot of trouble opening up their heart. I will work with them in the sense of I'll teach them how to feel that they already have a shield and all the protection in the body like this shield moves. Mm -hmm. Everything moves in our whole body even as we sit here. The blood is moving, the breath is moving, there's so much movement going on inside of us and helping people to feel that um, is, is important. Um, I don't know if I quite answered the the question. Well, you gave us some good information for sure. But I could, can, could I just say a little more about? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> of course you can. Uh, addressing, I mean, some of the people that come to me have had um, a lot of uh, trauma in their bodies, medical trauma, injuries. Some people have experienced abuse. 
um, sexual abuse as a child or physical abuse. So um, that's one reason people come is to is so that they can feel more comfortable in their bodies. Maybe they've talked about issues before, but they haven't. They still have the discomfort. So it's really important for me to help people to feel that their body is a good place and that movement is fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So I have a confession to make, and now, of course, you know, when my husband sees the show, <laughs> he's going to hear this. I was told not to go out the front door, but I didn't listen the other day, and I went out the front door with the dogs, and I fell down the stairs and mm -hmm. slipped on the ice. And I landed right on my tailbone, and my entire from there up hurts mm -hmm. on my back. Mm -hmm. So, Linda, if I came to see you regarding this issue, Donna, <laughs> how can how can you help me? Uh, well, my f the first thing I would do is kind of look at your body. I mean, I also um, would touch your body and see what it felt like, and ask you to make some really small movements and see what they're like, and. I think the very, very first thing I would help you do is just find a place of calm in yourself mm -hmm. and ease in yourself because that's kind of the starting place. And the movement that I would do with you if it was appropriate yet to do movement because sometimes when you first have an injury you don't even want to move. But if it was appropriate to move it would be just really soft, gentle movements that didn't cause any distress for you but that just kept building on that calm. Okay. And Linda, how could you help? Uh, well, I would. I would similarly uh, kind of have you check out what you could do, what kinds of movement you could do. Um, I would use my hands to help you, and you know maybe just breathe softly. I mean, when we when we have an injury or something, we often it's kind of like a shock. You fall and you go, <gasps> you know, there's that kind of shock, and that's part of what you were talking about, the nervous I system. Was shocked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you still seem a little shocked, yeah. actually. That's why I was saying. So sometimes that shock is there, and, and it's helpful to try to release the shock, you know, with your breath, with sighs, with helping you to feel um, like right now you're okay, you're safe, or feel the parts of your body that are okay, that do move, like yeah. the relief of that sometimes is important too. Okay, that sounds good. And, and can you give us a couple um, simple ideas just what you can do to release tension I know whenever I go to the doctor or dentist they're always like your neck is so tense like what are some <laughs> because like, I'm here to see you yeah that's yeah, probably why. there's that aspect <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know I always kind of feel that tightness like in through there what's is it start with breathing <laughs> or is there anything else you can do just relax a little yeah I have actually I think that's a, a I think that having quick tools are, are essential because even if we get up in the morning and we do do things to you know stretch or meditate or whatever to kind of center ourselves then we're out in the world and you're at the office and everything so I developed something I call five minute helpers I wrote them on cards and um, I give them to my clients and it has it has ten different things to, to do when when you're stressed so uh, well, we want to share one or two with us. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, one would actually be this whole movement, this touch right okay. here. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I call this touchstone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes this is a, just a calming thing, using our own hands to calm ourselves. Sometimes if I'm very stressed, I'll just. This is very helpful, just to bring your hands on your head. It helps. Mm -hmm. It helps bring blood to your head, which, which you can, uh, uh, which helps with clearer thinking. Um, just with breath, just something I call blowout, just <sighs> blowing the air out. And if you're if you're if you're um, have the space around you, you can sigh. Sighing is a wonderful thing because it it helps you come back to your breath. That would uh, be a good one for when we're stuck in traffic. Right. Absolutely. Sighing, blowing out. Oh, yeah, shaking things out sometimes is helpful. Shaking things out is really helpful. Yeah, yeah, shaking it out or with the shoulders. Sometimes I just te teach people to just you know bring their shoulders up and inhale, and then <sighs> lengthen them out because that tends to be the direction shoulders go is towards the ears. So sometimes if you actually do it and add it with the side, that's very helpful. That is. Uh, but I think I, I try to give people the idea that 
that anytime you, you, you can take a moment, you know, you, you're tense somewhere, you can always go out, you can go, go uh, walk on the way to the bathroom, you can do sighs, stretches, the shoulder things. Um, sometimes just taking a pause and leaving a situation will really help you think or it'll help, it's a, it's a strategy. Actually, um, I had a, a client and she was, uh, her, she had to have her mother live with her because her mother was having illness and her mother was always constantly telling her how horrible she was. Oh, and awful. Yeah, and so, awful. <laughs> so I suggested that every time my mother did this, she got up and went to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> no, because she tried talking to her mother, it didn't help. I said, well, just do that. And so it gave my, it gave, it, she, so it gave my client a way out of being the person here. Yeah, this. Yeah, and then yeah. eventually her mother said in a few days, do you have a bladder infection? <laughs> <laughs> but she started to notice that every time she started to do this, she was set left alone. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it was a very subtle way. And it, it, it also was empowering for my client. There was something she could do because telling her mother to stop didn't work. But that actually began to slowly. It made her feel better. What do you hear? Well, you the th only other thing, there's a great suggestions. And the only other thing that just comes to my mind that I think is important to mention is that when we notice that we're being tense, our first response is to want to like try to change that. Mm -hmm. And then what can happen is we can really get into a battle with it. So what I find for myself, because I, you know, I've put myself like, through my life, like in a lot of situations that have kind of stretched me and created tension, you know? Mm -hmm. Like maybe like you're actually being brave going to the doctor. Like maybe you don't really want to go there and you're just being brave about it. Mm -hmm. So in that stretching, there is going to be tension. So can we accept those feelings of mm -hmm. tension? You know, even before we try to do anything to them, can we just accept it? Because in the acceptance, I find a lot drops. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things about um, feeling in your body is its, its movement is so crucial you know, to obviously the work I do and the work Linda does. But there's also all these kind of um, just visceral ways of feeling tense, you know, butterflies in the stomach, heat, um, you know, suddenly feeling cold. And all those kind of things can be accepted. Mm -hmm. And then it's interesting, they tend to start to dissipate away. But no smashing or slamming things, right? You could that do would, that if you wanted to. I'm not going to tell you no. <laughs> that is great. That got permission. <laughs> Yay. But the question is, like, what's the end result of that? Does that really <clears throat> dissipate tension, or does that was that just like an outburst? Because mm -hmm. lots of times those things like, don't really make us feel better. There's just like a temporary thing, but then we feel bad about whatever we've smashed. That's true. Yes, that's true. But, you know, lots of people do go kickboxing or go running or... You know, like running after you've built up a lot of tension, aerobic activity gets the hormones out of your body. Okay. So maybe smashing a mirror would do that too. I don't know. <laughs> do you have anything to add to that, Linda? Um, well, I th I think the ex accepting seem, seem, seems important. Like, well, knowing that you're going to be that you might be stressful is is useful so you, i think it's like carrying your tools with you you know if you're going to in a very stressful situation what can you plan ahead of time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to to help thank you for joining us today donna and linda and if you'd like to find out more information about these women and their services please visit wboa.org <laughs>